Welcome everyone. I'm Beth Keen, CEO at Holocaust Museum LA. Thank you for joining us for today's program, How My Mother's Survival and Optimism Inspired My Leadership, a conversation with Lily Bossy. Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's discussion at no charge. If you're enjoying our programs, we ask that you consider supporting our work by making a donation to the museum at holocaustmuseumla.org. This discussion is the first in a series of programs that will highlight the experiences of descendants of Holocaust survivors. One of the things we focus on at the museum is the positive impact survivors have had on their own children and families. Our goal is to share the intergenerational impact of survivors and highlight second generation success stories. It is my pleasure to formally introduce the Honorable Lily Bossy. She was originally elected to the Beverly Hills City Council in 2011. She served as mayor in 2014 during the city's centennial year, and again in 2017. The only daughter of Holocaust survivors, Lily aims to ensure values of inclusion and diversity create a sense of community in Beverly Hills and beyond. Lily has been a longtime friend, advocate, and supporter of Holocaust Museum LA, and we are excited to have a conversation with her today about the impact her mother's never give up outlook, determination, and optimism had on her drive to become a community leader and activist committed to justice and equity. Lily, we are so excited to have you today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I thought we would, um, chat for the first 40 minutes and then open it up to questions for the last 20 minutes. But we encourage everyone who's on to please um, type in the Q&A if you, you know, have any questions while uh, during our conversation. So, Lily, your beautiful mother, Rose Torin, was a Holocaust survivor and experienced and witnessed the most inhumane atrocities imaginable. Um, why don't we start off by sharing your mother's background and personal story um, to provide context so people understand that while she was a strong, positive person, she was forced to live with and, and carry this tremendous trauma from her past. Thank you, Beth. And I can't even put into words how much it means for me to be here today. Um, as I've shared with you even before we went live, Beth, you are one of my sheroes. You are an incredible, incredible woman who is truly a trailblazer. And I found myself as I was waiting for the clock to tick 11, uh, and I saw on the screen, there was a photo of me and my mom and you know talked about in conversation regarding my mom. And I found myself and still feel extremely emotional right now um, because the one thing that she always wished for and wanted was for her, her story to live on. Uh, and I just feel so grateful to you, Beth, and, and everybody who is joining us today to allow for her story and all the survivor stories uh, to, to continue. So with all my heart, I, I thank you um, for this amazing, extraordinary opportunity. You know, I have to say being a daughter of a Holocaust survivor has many facets to it. Um, and as I've gotten older and myself, you know, have become a mom, 
I can view my mom very differently um, now than I did growing up. Uh, my mom was a very, very strong woman and very optimistic. And, you know, I know that many uh, survivors' children have different experiences. You know, my mom was someone that loved to talk about it, loved to talk about her story and wrote books about it, where there are others who, you know, have found it very difficult to do so. Um, it was, it was a, a mixed story because on one hand, my mom always told me I can be anything I want to be. I can achieve anything I want to want to do in my life. In many ways, I think she wanted me to live the life that she wasn't able to achieve. Um, and then on the other hand, there was the other side of a very overprotective mom, a mom that as much as she loved me was always worried and, and worried that, you know, I could get hurt or that somebody would, you know, hurt my feelings or, or that, uh, you know, something could happen to me. So there was like a dual reality growing up where I'm getting two messages. I'm getting the message that you can achieve and be anything you want to be. And then on the other hand, but I need to keep you close and I need to make sure that you're going to be safe. And I think even though I knew her story and I knew the tragedy and the horror, it was challenging. It was challenging because, you know, as, as a daughter and a mother with a daughter, there's always that tension and of wanting to have your own voice, but also, you know, respecting your mom and looking up to her. So I think, you know, with my mom, uh, you know, she survived Auschwitz. Uh, and her journey, um, you know, I think was went full circle for me because the reason how she survived the war was she was friends in the town that she grew up in. She grew up in a, sh a small shtetl called Struvyachuf. Don't ask me to spell it. And uh, she was friends with uh, the daughter of the mayor of that town. And when there were rumors about, you know, this war breaking out, the mayor of the town provided for her false papers that said that she was a, a Gentile Polish woman. And so when the war broke out, she, because of the false papers, was sent to a labor camp uh, that was filled with, you know, Polish Gentiles. And, you know, it was, it was safe, it was clean. Um, it wasn't a death camp. And at night, as she was sleeping in the barracks, uh, there was a woman who was sleeping and talking in her sleep, and she was speaking in Yiddish, which really showed my mom that there was other people that were pretending as well mm -hmm. to be, uh, you know, Polish Gentiles. So my mom went to that woman the next morning and said, you know, you need to be careful because in your sleep you were talking in Yiddish, which means you're Jewish. And I want you to know that I'm Jewish too. And she wanted to find a friend that was, you know, equally in the same path with her. So as it turns out, I guess there were other people who had heard this woman, you know, sleep, uh, while she was sleeping and talking in Yiddish and turned her in. And unfortunately, this woman turned my mother in. It's really painful to even imagine, but another Jew turned in another Jew. Um, and so at that point, my mom was sent to Auschwitz. And that became her journey um, of, you know, being a Holocaust survivor in one of the worst death camps in history. Well, first, I do want to say that you're my Shiro. I just wanted everyone to hear that. Oh, and, um, and I know, you know, when you were talking earlier about this push and pull, you know, um, this conflicting, you know, relationship with your mom. I, I know, you know, as the granddaughter um, of Holocaust survivors, and I know my mom is watching, <laughs> um, I know that many people who are also children of survivors can, that what you're saying is, feels so familiar. Um, so uh, I, I can definitely relate to that. And the story, um, uh, about uh, your mother, uh, you know, and, and surviving Auschwitz and um, what she endured, uh, the fact that she wrote two books and is pretty amazing. Um, you know, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Um, I want to ask you, 
you know, you're very well known in the community. Um, you're a well liked leader. Uh, you were elected to Beverly Hills City Council. You served mayor as mayor twice, um, and you know you spoke. Op you speak quite often, you know, openly about how you credit your mother for your successes. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know the initiatives in your role as um, council member and mayor that you know you started that were actually you know a direct influence of your mother's. Um, and maybe just generally, you know, how many of the choices you made were, you know, direct influences of your mother's. Thanks, Beth. Great question. You know, for me, when, when I ran for office the first time, uh, I told everybody and in all of my campaign materials, I even shared that I was an only child of Holocaust survivors. And there were many opportunities where people said to me, why are you even mentioning that? What does that have anything to do with your ability to be a good elected official, understand our community? Well, you know, why are you even bringing that up? And you know, what I said and how I feel today as I sit here, it has everything to do with it. It is absolutely the fiber of who I am. Uh, you know, growing up, as I shared, you know, having a Holocaust survivor mom, especially being an only child, uh, really defined me, it, you know, in terms of the strong work ethic that mm -hmm. I saw, the the value of community, the value of giving back. You know, I think I, I grew up with understanding that there's things that could be taken away from you so easily, but a sense of community, a sense of family, a sense of purpose, a sense of connection uh, is something that is directly, I believe, um, because of having my mom be a survivor of Auschwitz and a Holocaust survivor. Um, you know, I have a very strong sense of, um, you know, I, I don't give up and everybody knows that, you know, my motto at City Hall is, you know, we start with yes, mm -hmm. and then we figure out how. So as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing we can't do. We just sometimes have to pivot. And we certainly learned that this past year in terms of learning to pivot. Uh, I think for me, uh, you know, the fact that I was an only child, my parents were a, quite a bit older than all of my other friends' parents. Uh, my parents were European and they were immigrants. They had an accent. Uh, a lot of people that I, you know, grew up with didn't. So for me, I always yearned for an extended family. I always yearned for a sense of community outside of just the nucleus of what I grew up with. So I think for me, quite honestly, a lot of my passion um, for uh, being an elected official and giving back was to create a sense of community. And I think because my, you know, my, my mom was so discriminated against, my nature is to be very non-judgmental, that I love inclusion, I love diversity, I love bringing people together. And mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite initiatives that we did in the city was the first time um, I did walk with the mayor. And that hadn't been done before, where, you know, generally when you're the mayor of a city, you know, you wouldn't necessarily open yourself up in a public arena with hundreds of people weekly saying, okay, come talk, you know, come talk to me about whatever issues you have. So I think, for example, that initiative where every Monday morning we would meet in front of City Hall and we would have hundreds of people that would connect together from all walks of life, from all over. I mean, we would have people that would come that weren't even Beverly Hills residents just to have that sense of connection. So um, I think it showed a new way of leadership and connecting with elected officials. You know, I've always wanted to be accessible. I give everybody my cell phone number. I'm on social media way before people were on social media. You know, I really enjoy the sense of connection and community and family. And I know that that's really uh, an extension of growing up with you know, Holocaust survivor parents and understanding that community and family is always number one. I do remember when you did implement that program, Walking with the Mayor, mayor and I thought that was just brilliant. And I love, and I used to follow you and I, I loved seeing the photographs and, and um, your posts on social media. And I always was in awe of the group of people that 
you know, because that was, it was weekly, right? Didn't you do yeah. that every Friday? Or? It was every Monday. Um, right. And okay. because I wanted to start off the week in a positive way. I wanted to reframe what Monday looked like. You know, part of the, the motto was, what is the best day of the week? Mm -hmm. Monday, because it was a day that we could all start together as a community. And I felt that that was setting the tone, you know, for, for mm -hmm. a sense of community and connectedness. And, and, and you would always see people of, you know, all colors get together. And I, I was always all amazed ages, by that. People yep. bring their pets. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we had uh, a woman who was in her early 90s that was in the front of the walk every week. Um, and, you know, towards, uh, towards uh, you know, further out in the year, she ended up having a hip replacement and she came with her walker to continue. Wow. So, you know, it was a sense where everybody was welcome in a sense of community. And I think as long as we have a, a strong sense of community with each other and recognize, even if we're diversified, that we we have more in common than we do differently. And I think that's the way that you can see that when you really experience each other together. Exactly. And you can see the impact that your positive outlook is actually has on the people in the community, which I think is so great. Um, and one of the things you mentioned, I know when we talked um, earlier, you mentioned to me that your father was also from Poland, but he had a different experience, even though he wasn't in the camps, he was an engineer working in in Russia, um, in Russia, and he also lost his family. So, um, so I, I know, I mean, as also as the granddaughter of survivors, that feeling of community, your friends become your family, your, you know, best friends are like, you know, siblings and your aunts and uncles aren't really your blood aunt and uncle. They're, you know, I mean, I hold, I hold friends, friendship sacred and mm -hmm. people know that, you know, I, I truly view my girlfriends like they're my sisters, literally blood sisters. And I, and I view that sense of community and loyalty as a moral compass. So, you know, I, it is really the fiber of who I am, for sure. So during this past year, you know, um, it's been quite challenging and, and we've been lucky, you know, at the museum to um, get inspiration from our Holocaust survivors. And, you know, early, early on during the pandemic, um, when I had conversations with survivors, um, Many of them would just say, you know, that being forced to stay at home is keeping us alive during the Holocaust. That meant, you know, the Nazis can come find us. And being at home, we have our computers and Zoom and FaceTime, and it, you know, where we can stay connected. And you know, they just always focused on the positive. So while it's been challenging, you know, um, it's been great for us to get inspiration from them. What what do you think, you know, your mom would say? you know, if she were alive during the pandemic. Thank you, Beth. You know, for me, this past year, like all of us, was the most challenging year of my life. I think uh, only second to when I lost my mom and when I lost my dad. When I lost my parents, I think that rattled me to the core of my essence. And this past year really did that for me as well. It was the most challenging year, both personally, as well, you know, as an elected official because um, everybody was in pain uh, mm -hmm. you know, on, on some level. Um, yeah. To imagine that we're living through a global pandemic was and continues to be um, really hard to get my heart and, and my mind around. Although I do believe that we are finally heading towards better days. Uh, but you know, this past year, as hard as it was, I found myself many times actually reaching back to um, old videos that my mom had done during the Shoah Foundation uh, when they interviewed her. And there's one particular video that, sh that she did that I watched again and again this past year where she was talking about how she looks up in the sky and she sees clouds and she knows how challenging those days can be. And there's, there's clouds and it can be dreary. But she would say, even through those clouds, I know there's sunshine. 
And I know that sun is going to come through. And even, you know, I'll find a speck or I can find to peek through a little bit of the sunshine. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And then she said, and you have to never give up, never, ever give up. Even if you want to, you can't give up. So I did find myself many times during this year, going back to that one video to find that little ray of sunshine that she said was there, even when I couldn't see it and to not give up. And it really helped get me through. As a matter of fact, I, I had a friend who um, had COVID this past year and she um, was very, 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 um, she was sick and very challenged by it. She's better now. And she reached out to me actually and said, Lily, can you send me that video that you had posted a while back about your mom in the sunshine? Because I feel like that can inspire me. So that also felt good that my mom's words resonated with others who were having a hard time this past year as well. I'm sure she made a huge impact on, you know, all of your friends, anyone who, who knew her, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing about my mom. Um, I know there are a few people who are watching today who, uh, who had known my mom and, you know, they would tell you that she was a dynamite woman. She was, you know, really dynamic and personable and always very well read and loved to travel. She was among the first people in the world to go and explore China and explore Russia and Egypt when nobody was going there because she was just had a, a, a um, big sense of curiosity and a people person. So uh, people just loved her because she was always the life of the party. You know, very, very dynamic woman. Right, right. And I know one of your mantras is to, you know, always be kind to people. Um, and that was something also that I'm sure was something from your mother as well. Be Absolutely. kind and respectful. And especially, you know, yeah. this past year, I think we as a nation have seen a lot of divisiveness. Mm -hmm. and even in our community, we experience that as well. And I've always been the type of person that no matter what somebody's political thoughts are um, or any thoughts, even if they're different than mine uh, or mine is different than theirs, I'm always open and wanting to have the conversation and I always listen. So I think that's really important. I think it's really important to be able to try to listen to to everyone. And even if you go in there thinking, oh, we have nothing in common, or we're on the opposite uh, you know, sides of the aisle or such, if we listen clearly and really open our heart and open our mind, I am convinced that we will find a common ground somewhere. And with that, I think is how we can open the door and create change together. So I, th and I think that is also because of what I grew up with. I think, you know, when you grow up realizing that all of your ancestors were murdered because of their religion, because of their race, because of their beliefs, I grew up vowing that I will be the complete opposite, that I will always be open to anybody, no matter what their religion, what their beliefs, what their thoughts are, and that let's try and find a common ground together. I know I, I wonder all the time, like what would my grandparents think if they were alive, you know, this past year and exactly what you're saying, you know, that's why we, we do the work that we're doing. <laughs> it's so important because we know what they went through and because of what they endured and, and, you know, we need to ensure never again. And that's why I think it's so great that you're in a position of a leadership position like that as an elected official. So, um, I know didn't was the name of your mom's book never give up or uh no she had was, two books one yeah. of them was called destiny and okay. and the second book was called a uh, a new beginning but her motto in life and literally every single day of my life mm -hmm. even the morning that i saw her before she passed before she took her last breath she said to me never give up never ever give up um so oh. it is really truly my mantra i mean literally from you know what i can remember even having a memory um until her final breath um that is what i heard every day of my life and believe me you know there are days and certainly this past year um 
where you just feel like we're hitting a, you know, a, a brick wall, you know, especially in, in an elected position where you're, you know, finally feeling like you can open up and, and have life happen again. And then all of a sudden we have to pull back and close again and, you know, jumpstart that we, we all went through this past year. There were definite days where I definitely heard my mom say, never give up. You can't give up. You've got to find that sunshine in the clouds. And even on her tombstone, it says never give up. Wow, I love that. I think um, we'll, we'll have to find that clip, the testimony that you were talking about, and maybe we could share that um, with the audience. Um, and in, on and my in, social media. share the recording. I think I've posted that many times. <laughs> and, and often, even with my social media, I always post what it is I need to remember for that day. And, uh, and th there's been many times this past year where I needed to hear my mom's voice because who better than a survivor? Exactly. Who, who survived, mm -hmm. you know, things that we can never even describe in words to give us a, a path forward during the most challenging time that we have faced this past year. Yeah, so at the museum, you know, we we are committed to uh, preserving the survivors' legacy and, and memories and to, you know, retell their stories. And, you know, as second generation, third generation, even fourth generation now, we, we're becoming the storytellers for the witnesses, right? right. So that, that's a big responsibility to carry. And, you know, it's something I think about all the time. And I think about, you know, am I even doing my grandparents any justice <laughs> the way I retell their story? Um, so oh, you are, Beth. You I, really <laughs> I try. Um, so, you know, it's it's a big responsibility. And, you know, I think about that a lot. And I'm sure you do, too. Absolutely. And and even I'm just wondering your own children, because I know they were in their 20s and they had a close relationship with, you know, your mother, which is really nice. Um, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about like our role, you know, as torchbearers and, you know, this responsibility that, you know, we have to make sure their stories are never forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's what I was saying that even before we turned live, at 11, I found myself getting so emotional about what we were about to do, what we are doing right now, um, because I do feel that what we're doing, what you do specifically, yes. Beth, every day, and what the museum does every day. I think Lily just froze. Really? Or did I freeze? I think you froze. Uh, I'm moving. okay. You better. <laughs> are we okay? Um, you know, I yeah. think. Yeah. That that is to me, the, the one way that we can truly honor all of those people who, um, you know, those who survived and those who didn't, um, to be able to honor all of my ancestors who didn't survive, that, you know, it wasn't in vain. Um, and I remember mm -hmm. when I was a little girl and I remember sitting with, you know, talking to my mom and I was actually going to, um, Hillel, which was a Jewish day school. And I came home from school and I said to my mom, where was God? You know, it, it automatically you know, dawned on me, well, how did this even happen? And why did it happen? It doesn't make sense. You know, where was God? And, and I remember my mom saying to me, oh God, you know, God was there. You know, God um, allowed me to, to survive and, and you to survive, to tell the story so that this never happens again. And that, you know, humanity, um, that we're human and that even in humanity, we have a side mm -hmm. of us that's good and a side of us that isn't good. And that we need to really cultivate the goodness in us. So for me, telling the story and honoring those who, who fought and didn't survive and those who did survive, is really part of, I believe, my journey. And I know that even my boys, you know, growing up, you know, they were very close to my mom and knowing her story and knowing me and knowing, you know, cause I've shared with them how being an only child of a Holocaust survivor, how it affected me. Um, and so I think mm -hmm. even they will take that forward into their lives because, you know, I think it's part of the DNA 
of, of anybody who uh, is a survivor child or a grandchild of a survivor and such. And you know, I, I think we all take it very, very responsibly um, with a tremendous amount of honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I can really, I feel like I tell people I live and breathe Holocaust. <laughs> not, in a, and that's not bad, you know, it's, um, and I tell people, you know, when people think, isn't it depressing working at a Holocaust museum? No, not at all. I mean, right. I'm inspired yeah. every day. It's inspiring. it's inspiring, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people who walk through our doors, we know they're leaving, you know, um, a different person, you know, they're leaving with a sense of responsibility when they go out into their communities. So we know we're having, you know, a positive impact on people. And you mentioned, you know, people have, you know, can make good choices. And that mayor, you know, in your mom's town, right. who took your mom in, um, you know, and then fast forward, your mother's own daughter becomes mayor. I mean, that, you know, must have been something so special for her, right? It, it was pretty incredible. And, you know, my mom, uh, towards, you know, the last number of months of her life, uh, had a few times where we almost lost her. And even mm -hmm. uh, before I became the mayor, uh, at that time, you know, she was in very, very critical condition in the ICU to the point that, you know, the physicians, you know, sat me down and said, you know, this is probably it. And um, my mom survived it. And she woke up from that moment and said, you know, it's not my time. I'm not going. I want to see you be the mayor. And she literally, mm -hmm. she literally was there, um, you know, literally just weeks after being in the ICU to see me become the mayor. And she she lived almost towards the end of the term. You know, my term was up in March and she she passed away in February. So she didn't see the entire term, but she she was able to to see that. And and part of uh, even uh, at her funeral during the eulogy, my older son Andrew said that when he came and visited her, the first thing she would say to him every time was, Your mom's the mayor. Your mom's the mayor. Mm -hmm. So she, she um, felt a tremendous amount of pride and also saw the full circle of her life that she was, you know, she survived initially because of a mayor and fast forward, she, you know, got to see her daughter become the mayor of Beverly Hills, which, you know, she moved to Beverly Hills primarily for me. Um, you know, right. she thought that, you know, it was a very world famous uh, city that, you know, provided, you know, safety, security, education, and, uh, you know, the American dream. And so it's, it's very, very powerful to know that she was able to, to see the full circle of her life. I only wish she was able to be today, yeah. right now, although I'm sure she is. I'm sure she's looking down at you right now. <laughs> I can just imagine, you know, the amount of pride she must have had, you know, seeing her daughter become mayor and, you know, exactly after what she where she came from and what she had endured definitely i feel that way um so is there is there anything else before i see there are a lot of questions now um popping up so um i have to go through them is there anything else that um you want to say or share with us about your mom your parents before I move on to the q and a i'm I'm happy to ans answer any questions so okay love to hear from people um so okay the first one is about racism fueled Nazi ide ideology and policies what can we learn from the Holocaust in dealing with racism issues today I I, I mean, one thing that I always tell people is that, you know, the Holocaust didn't just fall from the sky. And I, I'm sure your mom um, and even your dad, you know, growing up in Poland, talked about what life was like even before the Holocaust. And, and you know, one thing my grandmother used to say to me and my sister is don't get, even though my grandparents were very patriotic and also, um, you know, loved America and came here for, you know, to provide their own family, you know, with opportunities. My grandmother used to always say, don't get too complacent. And I didn't understand what she was talking about really and, until, you know, recently when 
we experience all this, you know, all the divisiveness in our own country. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I agree. You know, for me, I do think it starts with us. And as I had said earlier, I think because I grew up recognizing that my whole family and, and millions of people were murdered because of their religion, because of their sexual identity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up, the fiber of, of who I am is the opposite. You know, I, I don't look at people based on their religion, based on the color of their skin, based on their political parties and such. And, and I think if, you know, we have to start with our next generation, with our kids, with who we are, to recognize that, you know, we have to find more similarities than differences. Um, and, you know, I think we, we, we see that today and it's all about hate. People hate without even understanding that, you know, there's no reason for hate, that we, we have to use a different way of approaching each other. And like I said to you earlier, you know, I'm always open and wanting to have conversations with me that have a different life experience in every way. And without any preconceived notions that, you know, we have to really approach people with an open heart and an open mind. You know, every day we, we are reading about different racisms of, of different cultures, um, different religions, different color of your skin and such. But, you know, I view us all as human and we need to be humane to each other. I view ourselves, I'm very spiritual as souls and living a human experience and that we just need to be kind. And um, it's really hard because, you know, there, there's a lot of people that aren't viewing us that way. And we have to be, we have to have that change that more people are like us that want to accept one another and not judge um, and hate one another because they're different. And hopefully that will, the pendulum will change that there'll be more people that approach each other with an open heart and an open mind. And I think it's for up to us and the next generations to help with that tide. I agree. That was well said. And we need more elected officials like yourself. <laughs> That's very important. <laughs> Grassroots politics and, you know, um, is, is really important. Um, okay. When someone wants to know if you grew up with cousins. I did, but they weren't first cousins. Um, because my, my mom's, and I think you had touched on this also, you know, my mom's and my father's brothers and sisters um, all were murdered during the Holocaust, but she, ha she and had first cousins. So they ultimately became, as you said, um, anybody who was somehow related to my mom all of a sudden became my aunt and my uncle and their kids became my cousins. So yes, I did. Uh, and uh, like I said earlier, everybody that I become close to becomes a relative of mine and becomes a sister or a brother anyway. So um, I, I make everybody family in one way or another. Um, okay, uh, Susanna Landers, um, thank you for your, this inspiring conversation, incredible strength and hope in your mother's story. Um, Susanna is a third generation who grew up Jewish in Slovakia. She's Suzanne is also a docent at our museum and educator. She's always been fascinated by our ancestors' strength, determination, and willingness to overcome and rebuild. My question for you is, how do you connect those values and memory of your mother you have with the future? How do you transform those values to the next generation? Well, I think, you know, for me, it's really the fiber of who I am. Uh, you know, the, the, the message that I got from my mom every day to never give up is the same message that my, uh, you know, our sons hear every day. It's the same message I bring to my political career, like I had shared earlier at City Hall. Everybody knows my motto is we start with yes, mm -hmm. and then we figure it out. So, and I think that really came from the same concept of never giving up. Um, if, if I start with believing that there's a sunshine first, then I can get through the clouds. So uh, it really is the fiber of who I am. And, and even when uh, things don't go as I had planned, I always view that there's a reason for it. And 
to pivot because something better is about to, to happen. So I think it's how I conduct myself. It's how I am with my friends. It's how I am with my family. It's how I am in my, in my career. Um, and I think, you know, I'm attracted to like-minded people, people who um, are curious, people who are open-hearted and open-minded and believe that we can achieve things together because the bottom line, and I think why I've been so fortunate is because nothing I've done has been by myself, nothing. Anything that has been great that has happened in my job at City Hall has been because I've had so many people by my side that we do it together. And I think that's the other thing is find people who have the same open heart, open mind, shared vision, and then you can accomplish everything is really find a community and a group of people to do it together with you. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. And, and, and it's okay, you know, to disagree. Let's, let's Absolutely. have a civil discourse about it though. Let's talk to each other respectfully <laughs> and Absolutely. in a civilized manner. This is a and good one. Yeah. Oh, this is a good one. How can we get you to Oprah? <laughs> you are beyond inspiring. Oh, that is so sweet. Thank you. Well, uh, you. Get a new car and you get a yeah. new car. <laughs> Thank you. That's very sweet. Um, She's pretty amazing. That, that was from Piera Klein. Oh, that's oh, no, I think, no, that was for these. these okay, there are so many questions happening now that my screen is almost <laughs> blowing up. Um, okay. Um, what did um your did what did your mother share about her liberation experience and her journey to the US and were those formative in how she saw life and family post Holocaust? That's one from one of our board members, Yaniv Tepper. Thank you. You know, I think I think for my mom, um I think the hardest part that I saw with my mom was she always was longing for family. She was always longing for connection. She was always longing for her mother, her siblings. You know, one of her sisters, she never got confirmation, had died. So she spent most of her life trying to find her, which, you know, uh, up until now, we still don't know. Um, so I think, I think for me, one of the things I experienced was a dual part of my mom in that there was a side of her that as I shared was very optimistic and, and um, you know, very vibrant and dynamic, but there was a side of her that always had a sense of loss, mm -hmm. a sense of, uh, of a hole in her heart, a hole that, you know, I think in many ways she had hoped that I could fill, but I don't know that I even could have because she yearned for family and connection. And I think as we see with many Holocaust generations, it becomes part of one's DNA. And I think that also in some ways explains me too, in that I feel that I also um, searched and longed for connection and family and community. And, and, and I found it in what I do. And I think, um, you know, my mom found it in me and in my father. But um, I think for her and after, you know, surviving, that was something that really, I believe, stayed with her for her whole life. Yeah, I mean, I still have this image in my head of my grandfather scouring the white pages, always just looking for relatives. And, and whenever my grandparents traveled to other cities, that was the first thing he did. He picked up the white pages, you know, he picked up the phone book just to see if <laughs> there were any relatives, anyone he knew. And I, you know, I think that, that to me is, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think a human condition because I think mm -hmm. even past year, what we all went through with, um, with COVID and the lockdown and having to be separate from each other, mm -hmm. I think we all, what we realized is that what we missed more than anything was the sense of human connection was the sense of hugging someone we love or being physically close to someone we love. So mm -hmm. I see that even the experience that she went through and the longing for connection and, and you know, being able to be with someone that we love is, is uh, a universal human feeling because we all experienced that this past year. Absolutely, and little things that we took for granted 
that right. were, you know are now a novelty things that we miss okay um let's see um, from Eric Cohen, I find myself getting caught up in the divisiveness of the current political situation, people not wearing masks, spreading what I see as misinformation. I want to have an open heart and mind. What do you do in those moments? Ah, well, I do do that, actually. Um, hi, Eric. I know Eric. He's a great <laughs> Um, there, there are people in our community who feel very differently about mask wearing. Um, they, you know, don't agree with it and such. And, some of those people, uh, as a matter of fact, one of them I, I spoke to this morning, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not somebody who um, will make the other person the enemy if they feel otherwise um, than I do. So I, I really try and talk to people and, and try to find some sort of a commonality um, and respect each other for our differences. But that's my personality. And I think that's the way for me to try and bridge our differences. Uh, um, so I really try to, in many ways, I feel that the best thing to do is to be able to talk to people who think differently than us, who live their lives differently than us. I don't want to just be talking to people who think exactly as I do. I'm not going to grow that way. Uh, right. And I feel that if I can understand why somebody is thinks the way they do and understand their experience and their life journey uh, and they hopefully can experience me with an open mind and an open heart that somehow we can meet in the middle because i don't know that i'm ever going to be able to and i've tried and they've tried to to change somebody who really believes that wearing a mask is and i've used their you know a suffocation device is the term that i've heard people say you know and they're not gonna be able to convince me that I feel that wearing a mask is really respectful to others and also for my self health. But I think if we are able to try to hear each other and respect each other's differences, that that to me is a sense of hope of moving divisiveness forward. That we can agree to be respectful, agree that we might have differences of opinions, but you know, the only way, in my opinion, to move divisiveness forward is to try to hear each other and, and do it in a, in a, in a loving, open-hearted way. And it's hard sometimes, trust me, but it, it, it has been working for me. <laughs> One of the things that the museum we started doing before the pandemic is we would take eighth graders, Jewish day school class, and a school from like, south los angeles and instead of having you know the students um from one school be all together in the tours we divide them so that the tours have half you know from one school and half of the other school and then when they're done they sit around and share their reflections and they discover they have more in common <laughs> than, uh, you know than they realize um and and you know i think it starts with education we you know put kids together at a very young age and they learn to respect their differences and, you know, learn, learn different cultures. Um, you know, our, this world would be very different. <laughs> um, okay. My mom has a question. Um, you mentioned your mom had fake papers at the start of the war. And I know my parents and I also had forged documents after the war in order to qualify as an immigrant to the US. How do you answer people who in our current immigration crisis are intolerant of anyone who dares to cross the border illegally as I believe so many are desperate for escape? Well, hmm. first of all, uh, thanks for the question. And you have an amazing daughter. Oh, Is that the mom that, uh, that so sweet. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm somebody who is very tolerant of, um, and not only tolerant, I don't want to even use that word, I'm very embracing of, of, of immigrants, because, you know, my journey is, is the uh, immigrant journey. And quite honestly, I would say that probably most Americans are coming from an immigrant journey. Uh, so for me, it's, it's challenging when, when people aren't accepting of, of the immigration path, because, uh, you know, I think if we all look back somewhere in our history and our ancestry, 
we understand that we are, you know, we come from uh, a, a line of immigrants. Uh, so, you know, for me, I, you know, my, my journey is to try and with my sense of who I am to, to spread, you know, tolerance and, and, and openness to, to people from, from everywhere, you know, from everywhere in the world, no matter, you know, where, where they're from. Um, because I, you know, America embraced my parents, you know, um, they, they, after the war, they went to Israel and then they, you know, came through Ellis Island to New York. And if America hadn't embraced my parents, I wouldn't be here. It would be a completely different journey. And, you know, I keep going back to what I said earlier in that I, I really feel that we need to be, you know, human loving beings um, and that we, we have to embrace each other. So it's, it's hard for me to be tolerant of that because that's the journey I came from. And I'd be pretty hard pressed to even imagine those who are intolerant that if they look uh, in, into their lineage, somehow or other, there's gonna be a path to immigration as well for them. So I'm just hoping that, uh, you know, there are more of us that are uh, embracing of, of people from all walks of life and that that ultimately will be um, our future. You're right, I wouldn't be here either <laughs> if our country didn't take in my grandparents. Um, we have from Amy McIntosh, how can someone like me, a non-Jewish person, support and honor the lessons of the Holocaust and survivors like your mother? How can I support the Jewish community? So uh, do you wanna also answer that too? Cause I think you're doing that. I mean, I'm happy to answer it, but Beth, I think what you're doing right now speaks to, to Amy's question. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's, uh, it starts with education. We, we know also, you know, education is our greatest catalyst for change. That's what we, you know, we know that. Um, we know that when the students enter the museum, they might enter as bystanders, they leave as upstanders. Um, you know, so I, I can't stress enough, you know, the importance of, you know, um, coming to the museum, share, you know, telling people about um, the museum because it's really the, the lessons of the Holocaust are, is, those are the most important lessons we have <laughs> to teach people about tolerance and dignity and respect because we know what can happen. We know what can happen when um, bigotry and hatred go unchecked. So learning from Holocaust survivors, I encourage if anyone ha has the opportunity to meet a survivor, um, the museum has weekly uh, survivor talks. Now they're on Zoom when we reopen, hopefully this summer, crossing our fingers. Um, you can come and see the survivor speakers in person. It is so important to hear their stories. It's so important to just come face to face with an object um, from the Holocaust, you know, uh, um, an object that weathered the Holocaust and learn the, the personal story behind that object. I don't know if you want to add. Uh, yeah, I, I do. And thank you, Amy, for that question. You know, for me, this is beyond just, you know, being Jewish or non Jewish or anti Semitism or not. You know, I think we, we are seeing this right now as we speak. We're seeing this even with Asian hate right now. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that there's a sense of intolerance for, for others, whether it's the color of your skin, whether it's your political belief or your, um, your religion or such. Uh, you know, so for me, it's just really about seeing that we are all you know, human. We all, no matter what, what color of our skin we have or religion or, or how we choose to lead our lives, that we can't have a sense of a prejudice. And uh, I really think it, it, it starts with us. It starts with us and it starts with how we lead our lives towards each other. And, and, you know, I, and unfortunately, what I've seen is, you know, hatred, unfortunately, can be taught very young. It can be taught in the home um, by, you know, what you, you, you are learning, you know, from your parents or from your friends and such. And I think for me, because I grew up really understanding that because of 
uh, a religion, because of a race, um, you know, there was murder. I've I've learned that we we have to do it differently. That it has there's it's it's never again, and it's never again beyond just um, you know Judaism. It's never again against anybody. That we have there's there's no room for hatred. There's no room for bigotry or racism towards any culture, any religion, and that it starts with us. And I think if, you know, if there's enough of us, then we can create change. And I know, Amy, and I know, Amy, that is exactly how you live your life every day. So you already knew well the Well said, well said. I, I completely agree. Let's focus on what we have in common. Enough, we, we hear enough about all of our differences, but what we have in common and just treating people with respect and dignity. Um, you're absolutely right. Okay, I missed a couple of questions. Um, Bonnie Goldstein. Uh, Lily is so wonderful. Oh, <laughs> Lily is so wonderful sharing her story and her mom. Oh, where'd it go? Sharing her story and her mom is here with us today. Um, what is Beverly Hills and Holocaust Center able to do to help our Asian community members? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll answer it for in, in terms of Beverly Hills. You know, we, we number one, value respect. We, we have a human relations commission specifically comprised to make sure that we are a, a, a city that values number one, a sense of inclusion, diversity. Our city is a very diverse city and we have no tolerance for racism or hatred. And uh, we, I mean, that is the fiber of who we are as a community. So, uh, you know, not only do we have a commission, but it is really the fiber of everything that we do. And if we ever hear of anything that we as a council stand up to it, you know, we'll, we'll pass a resolution. We, we will work with whatever groups there are to help combat uh, racism um, or any sort of hatred. Um, and we actually just recently, I think it was yesterday, you know, publicly said that we are standing side by side, our brothers and sisters of the Asian, you know, community that has been facing uh, some really terrible racism um, recently. But, uh, you know, we, uh, would do anything, anything that we can to make sure that everybody that lives in our city, visits our city, works in our city, uh, feels that they are safe, um, that, that there is no issue whatsoever with any discrimination. Yeah, and, and for the museum, um, we started a program um, last summer called Building Bridges, where we bring together leaders from the um, Asian communities, the um, African American community, the Jewish community, um, and who am I forgetting? Um, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> did I leave anyone out? Um, so it's called Building Bridges, and um, you know, every every month focuses on uh, the Latin community. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, Every every month we focus on a different topic, and and this month it is about um, the hate crimes targeted against the Asian community. But it it is there's no room for hate. Period. No matter what your color is, your background, your ethnic group, whatever your beliefs are, there is no room for hate. And we all need to stand up together. We all need to you know. Um, collectively stand up and speak out whenever we hear you know, something wrong. And the museum has a responsibility to the community, to, you know, um, to the world really, because of what we do and what we stand for. And so if we see something wrong, you know, we'll issue a public statement, we'll make ourselves you know, heard. It is, it's so important. We can't just sit quietly. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think we're coming, it's 12 o'clock and I think I answered, I think I got to all the questions um, except Piera Klein, is there anything you can't wait to do post pandemic? I think that is the last question. Absolutely, that's an easy one. <laughs> what I miss more than anything is hugging. I, I am a huge hugger. 
you know, before the pandemic, when somebody would give me their hand to shake, I'd say, I'm a hugger, and I would hug them. Um, so <laughs> what, what I miss more than anything is, is the, the sense of physical touch and intimacy with, with people. I, I can't wait to hug every single person that will let me hug them. So uh, definitely that. That's, that's I, what I miss. I, I agree. I know. <laughs> I know that feeling. I can't wait also. Well, Lily, this was amazing. I can't thank you enough. Thank you for your candidness, for being so open, for sharing your mother with us and, and all of your, you know, um, your just your positive outlook. We, we can all learn so much from you and we thank you for that. And as a follow-up, I promise to share with everyone um, your mom's testimony. <laughs> thank you, Beth, and thank you for everything that you're doing and thank you for everybody that joined in today. My mom's birthday is April 10th, uh, which is around the corner, and we're uh, about to go into Passover for those who celebrate. And, you know, Passover was one holiday that always reminded me of my mom because she always used to cook everything from scratch. And, and even oh. though she's not here physically, I think what, what you have allowed me to do today um, felt like a, a wonderful way to connect with her um, yet again. So I thank you, Beth, and thank everybody who chose to spend this hour with us and especially thank the museum for, for really honoring um, the survivors and, and making sure that in the future, all tolerance of every religion um, that we continue in the right path. So I'm greatly honored and I send everybody my love. And when I see you, you're gonna get a big hug. And I just want to add, I can't close without reminding everyone that um, we do have a couple of programs um, coming up um, on April 27th. Um, we're going to host Mona Golubek as she brings the story of her mother, Lisa Yura, to life with a musical performance and a reading from her new children's book. And on June 8th, we will hold an intergenerational conversation with Second District Court of Appeals Justice Frances Rothschild, who is a hidden child. She will be joined by her daughter and granddaughter. And you can find our full calendar of events on holocaustmuseumla.org. And if you're enjoying our free programs, I have to remind everyone, you can become a member. If you go online on our website, please uh, consider becoming a, a member and you'll have access to many unique experiences. And thanks again for joining us today. And, and we hope to see everyone soon in person and we can give you big hugs. Exactly. <laughs> thanks, Lily. Thanks again. All right.